a certain amount. But anyways, I want to thank everybody for coming. Appreciate you guys doing here. Um, my, my whole goal here is, and I want to thank Mr. Nowak for being here because he's participated in a few of these things with me. I should just make him a code for dinner. Um, he's going to help me validate some of the stuff I'm discussing and make sure if I forget something, he'll remind me, I hope. But um, look, the goal here is to inform. Uh, how many people are aware of what's going on in terms of right to repair? Well, that's fantastic because uh, I can honestly tell you that I've been doing this circuit with the MD Expo now for almost two years. And when I first started this out and up until fairly recently, I wouldn't get but one or two hands in a room. And I've had as many as 75 or 100 people in a room. So it's it's really kind of scary. And you know, if you're into this profession, 35 years for me, um, it, it, there's a lot going on in it. We're at risk. We're potentially at risk now. There's some stuff that's happened that I'm gonna share here in a few minutes, but um, it, it it could have a huge impact on us. Um, I said it right here. Uh, okay, so if you'll notice on this slide, it says Kansas City. It's us. So uh, medical device servicing. It said collaborative community. It's now just community. Has anybody heard about the MDSC? Okay, cool. That's good because I'm gonna talk about it. So it, uh, I'm going to correlate it to a lot of what's going on with you know, thanks. Um, a lot of what's going on with what's called the right to repair throughout my presentation that are not necessarily tied together, but they actually support each other fairly well. And they're integrated pretty well. And so we'll talk about how that looks like, what it looks like. I can tell you that my whole goal here is that when you leave here today, you're more informed, that's all I'm asking for. There's also going to be a call to action in terms of, you know, I'd love for you guys to participate, get involved with separate conversation discussion. Let me tell you a little bit about TK real quick. I mean, I get to do a five second in infomercial. So anybody ever heard of Technology Associates? Okay. Um, where if, if you know Trimedics, if you know Crothel, if you know Sodexo, we're one of them primarily for us. The other things that we do that are hopefully advantageous for you guys that would be meaningful is we offer real-time location systems they're 75 percent cheaper than anybody else and they offer 200 percent more than anybody else it's, it's just a great product for practically nothing um reliable equipment available disinfectant or ready program so we'll, pre we'll put people on staff that will actually come in and clean your medical equipment between patient uses and provide either forward stocking and or uh, central stocking and deliver the product when needed, but it helps reduce infection carryover. Today in pandemic, that's a big thing. Uh, asset management is primarily what we'll do is we'll help out with, if you've got service contracts, service contracts that you don't want to manage, uh, we'll provide you 20% reduction, and then you can get the service from whoever you want. If you do the service yourself, we'll actually pay your staff to do the work. So that's another good opportunity. And then last is um, we also do high-end diagnostic imaging sales and service or equipment. So if we can help out in any way, please let us know. All right, so for those of us that have been around for a few years, in 1996, this is when this all started. They, um, the manufacturers said, hey, listen, we need to, uh, or we want to bring, we brought to the government. They said, you know, we got these people that are in here working on servicing our medical equipment that they shouldn't be doing it. And we want them to stop because they're taking money away from us. Well, you know, government said, wow go away. So we fought it. In 2006, they came back and they did it again, only this time it was a little more force and a little more rigor. And um, in fact, those of us that didn't work for the manufacturer at the time, there was a lot of effort put in, a lot of money that was spent, a lot of time to fight and combat the OEMs from saying they couldn't let, they didn't want us to service medical equipment again. And again, it was, um, it was thought, it was fraught, it was, it was, government said, went, go away. Well, in 2016, some of you may know this, the, the group uh, called MITA, uh, I'll get into them a little bit more here in a minute, but um, they're the manufacturer's representatives, primarily in imaging, but there's 140 manufacturers that all belong to MITA. They, oh boy, they finally got smart, right? They came back to the federal government and said, hey, I know that we've talked about in the past, we don't want these guys to touch our equipment, but in this particular case, we're telling you straight up, um, they're having an impact on the safety and the quality. People are dying because non-OEMs are servicing medical equipment. They literally said that. They literally, I'll explain it here in a couple minutes, but they literally brought pictures of pieces of equipment that were fixed erroneously that they're saying that people service besides OEMs. I'll get into a little bit more, but it, it got really hairy. So it was pretty, it was pretty, uh, pretty bad. And to their credit, uh, I hate to say it, but they were smart this time. They didn't come in just saying that 
they're land grabbing, that they're, you know, they're taking away money. They came in and they were smart and they said that people were dying and safety and quality was impacted. And that's pretty significant. And in in Canada, including myself, who wouldn't be concerned about that, right? I mean, if you or your family members are going to the hospital, you want to know that it's safe and that there's quality service going on. So um, this is where I, I tell a little story. And the reason that I feel it's important to tell the backstory is so you understand when we get to where we are today, how we got here and what it means and what it looks like and the people in the, that have committed and delivered what that looks like. So this started out, uh, as I said, around February, 2016 and Mida went to the FDA and they went to the Congress. They went to several Congress people and said, people are dying, less safe, less quality servicing of medical equipment and healthcare environments is, is taking place. And, you know, we think you should do something about it. So they go to Congress and, and, and Congress literally, um, I don't know if anybody, I don't even know what it means. I don't know if anybody else understands something called the Madufa bill, right? Um, it's insane. Thousands of pages, many things get addressed and covered. And on one page of this several thousand pieces of document, there was a paragraph like this, and it's way down in the middle of this page, paper that said, if they sign this Madufa bill, then it was going to mandate that no one other than no OEM could service medical equipment. This is a true fact. And we were literally within hours of that document being signed, which could have completely rocked our world when there's an organization called IMERS. Anybody ever heard of IMERS? Okay. okay. So IMERS is an organization that basically, like MITA does for the manufacturing side of the business, they do it for the non-manufacturing side. Primarily, they do imaging equipment. There's a hundred and something companies worldwide that belong to IMERS, but they represent the non-OEMs. And they have a, an attorney, actually a good guy, Rob Kerwin is his name. He's their attorney. He happened to be in Washington at the Madufa signing, knew what was in there, and raised his hand and said, I just want to bring to your attention, if you sign this, if you go to this paragraph in this thousand some odd page document, this is what it's going to mean. And Congress goes, whoa, 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 wait, are you serious? And they go and they look it up. And so they came back and they said, all right, guess what? We're not going to sign it today and we want the FDA to go look into what's going on here. Now the clock starts. So Mida, not happy about all this, says whatever. So now we start telling the story. And as they say, now the rest is story. So FDA, for those of you that know what FDA does, primarily their responsibility is to make sure that a piece of medical equipment that's going to go to market meets and does what you say it's gonna do, right? So if you're the manufacturer and you say that this tongue depressor is supposed to make, so that the tongue can be held down so they can see your tonsils, so that you can say, ah, and all that stuff, then they make sure that it does that. And they do that through data. I actually was a 510C, it's called a 510K. I was a submission officer for a hematology analyzer company out of Zurich, Switzerland for a few years. The reams and reams and reams of data that you have to provide to demonstrate that your piece of equipment is gonna do what it says you're gonna do, that they evaluate and then either bless it or deny it is incredible. But the FDA has that responsibility. In candor, they don't know anything about the other side of the equation. How do you service it? How do you maintain it? How do you keep it up and going, right? They don't know anything about that. They're only responsible to validate that the piece of equipment that's gonna go into market is gonna do what it says it's gonna do. And just to give you an idea what that means is, let's say you want to bring a new car to market and you were looking for permission to get it to, to be accepted. You would take a, an existing car that's very similar to what you want to build, and you would demonstrate that your car does all the same things that this other car that's already got the approval for, and so they would either say yes or no through data and a lot of data submission. But if you look at the mission and the vision of the FDA, even though they don't know anything or haven't been involved in the servicing or the other side of the OEM medical equipment, they said, okay, we'll go ahead and take a step at it, not recognizing what they were signing up for, or what they were getting into. And, um, and, and so anyways, you're going to see. Essentially, the FDA's mission and vision, by the way, is their goal through what they do, and this is how I sum it up, is they have to ensure that as a, um, a patient, a prospective individual that's going to go into a healthcare environment, that you're relatively certain that the environment and the medical equipment that's going to be used to treat you is going to be something that's going to work. That's their goal. And so when Congress turned to them and said, you need to own this, 
excuse me, not that they wanted to, they felt like, okay, we'll take it and see what happens. So what's the first thing that happens? Some of you may, did anybody participate? Is anybody even aware of the fact that around that time they asked for, they put out some documentation and they asked for, basically they, they put out seven words and they asked for people to give their opinion of the definition of those seven words and asked for people to give feedback as it relates to um, you know, what their perspective is in terms of these seven terms and how that impacted them. Anybody, would anybody participate in that? Anybody remember that? Besides Chris. <laughs> All right, so anyways, here's the deal. So you guys can probably, I'll just go through one or two, but you can probably remember, I don't know if this thing works. Let's see. Never mind. Um, services are regulated by the CMS, certified bodies, Joint Commission and others. Um, you know, current regulatory framework places unfair burden on some stakeholders. Anybody want to guess who probably wrote that? An OEM, right? I mean, because that's what they're that's what they're claiming. They're saying that they're they're being held to a higher standard than non-OEMs, and that's why they're saying that you know we need to be held to the same standard. And or basically, they would just love it if we went away and we couldn't service medical equipment. It would surely enhance their revenue streams. Anyways, long story short, the world. For all intents and purposes, there's a multifaceted in terms of who does servicing. But it, in my mind, and I'm happy to take feedback, but in my mind, there's four major categories. There's the OEMs. There's what's called the HDOs, Healthcare Delivery Organization, who works in-house for a hospital, directly for a hospital. Right? So you guys would be called HDOs, Healthcare Delivery Organizations. Then there's the ISO. Now, my world ISO really breaks down to two categories. Not everybody agrees with this, not everybody sees it this way, but let me explain my position. ACO, there is a ISO rather, Independent Service Organization. So as TKA, um, I'm an independent service organization. We provide an entire in-house program. We are essentially an HDO, but we're an outsourced solution. So we come on site, we put the camouflage outfit on that says we're an in-house program, even though we're really not. Now that's one area of ISO. There's your carpals, your sedexos, your trimedics, TKA, intermed, you know, bada, 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 bada. There's also the ISO, which to me is probably even more important, which is the independent service organization that focuses primarily on a modality or a device type, such as the IMRS organizations where there's groups out there, you guys all know them, right? Whether they're the, the Avantes, the Tri-Imagings, the, you know, they focus primarily in a type of device. So it's imaging, and it may be an MRI, it may be a CT, it may be PET scans, it may be cath labs, whatever it is. But there are different kinds of ISO. They don't necessarily do thermometers to MRIs, but they focus in a particular modality or device type, and they're still an ISO. And they are, they're, they're lumped into this whole argument, this conversation. So for the sake of conversation, which may come up later, I want you to understand how I view before. Does anybody disagree with that or can you think of others that I haven't thought of? So the only thing I can think of is like uh, General Electric, Phillips, who actually have ISOs, um, multi vendor service. Yeah. So I don't know if you guys could hear it, but you know, Chris talked about the two of them in particular are GE and Phillips. Siemens can't do it, they're not allowed to do it. Um, but GE and Phillips also offer what they call uh, ISO or independent service. Groups, right so what's interesting about all this is uh, because they got sued years ago I, I know about this personally because um, I had the only distributorship back at the crest days um, so they got sued many many years ago and so they're now their owner it has prevent them here in the United States to go any further than one deep and what that means is if they can't service it themselves they're allowed to hire another manufacturer to come in and service it or a rep that has been vetted in their vetting process is insane. But if they've been one deep, so if they hired me to go fix something, I can't then go hire somebody else. So it has to stop and they have to take the service back and do it themselves. But the interesting thing is GE, everybody, you can, there's, it's around a half a billion dollars in servicing that they do that's outside of a GE focus. Phillips, I'm understanding, is around 150 at this point, million dollars that they're doing. Um, and so on one hand, their parent organizations are going out saying, we need to stop people from servicing things that they're not representing manufactured. And on the other hand, they have many millions of dollars of business that they're about to shoot themselves in the head over if they were to win this thing. And 
in complete candor is I have many conversations and many roles that I play. When I sit across the table from the varying entities within GE and Phillips, they both say, I hate my parent company because they're wrecking my life. But you can't have it both ways. So it's a really interesting opportunity. So thank you, Chris. Good point. And, and I'm not arguing or disagreeing with you, but from my service, I just lump those into kind of what I do, right? Because if you carve them out as a standalone entity, take away their their moniker, if you will, the, the meatball or the other, it, it, they do what I do pretty much. They go in and they take over the bio. My point was the dichotomy. Yes. Where these OEMs are saying only OEMs can service equipment, right. but then they have these multi vendor independent service organizations servicing non GE equipment, non Phillips equipment. It, it's, it is a dichotomy. It's a great point. And, and in candor, the interesting thing is I know for a fact that as a GE employee, that if they're gonna go work on, let's say, a Phillips Imaging, they have even a harder time getting trained because of the fact that they work for GE than we do because we're not affiliated with one particular thing. So it, it really, it, one could make the case that their argument is really more set for them than it is for the rest of us, but another whole conversation. Okay, so here's what happens. They put out 2016, Moya puts together the, uh, the the initial paper to ask for people to give their definition and input essentially with seven words. They asked for people around the perspective, do you think this is an issue? Tell us why or why not? And they got gobs and gobs. I think there was a thousand and some odd people that responded. Then they, they put out that other thing and they asked for other people to give comments and questions and they did it. So from that, in candor, remember we're talking about the FDA. Remember that in my world there's a line. This is everything pre sale where they're research and develop design fda 5 k submission then they get it and they sell it so now i got to maintain and service it fda stops here they've never dealt here now they're getting into an area they've never been in before so they put out this white paper they put out this ask for for information and put and they got all this feedback and like holy shit, what do we do with this i don't know what to do with any of this stuff so they said all right we need more clarity we need more input so in october of 2016 did anybody go to Washington, D.C. for two days? Chris. All right. Um, let me tell you about it because it, really, um, it was really exciting. It was a cool opportunity. Since I, I've done this presentation a few times, but I've changed it a little bit because I, I'm a visual person, right? I, I learned to visual. So if you look on the left, uh, on the right side, let's start with the right side. The OEM, this is it without exaggeration. There were 400 people in this room. It was at the FDA building in Virginia. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, 400 were sitting in this room, and then they had many rooms and many off-site facilities where they had TV monitors where people could participate, but not be in the room. You walk into this room, it's huge. It's probably four times as long and three times as wide, and the entire right side as you walk in is the OEMs, but without exaggeration. Big briefcases, three-piece suits, $1,000 ties, and they are just marching in. You get on the other side, now it receives full. It's not like it's not more of them and less of us or left more than vice versa. But on the left side, most people don't even have a jacket on. We're not wearing ties. Nobody has a briefcase. Lucky if we got a couple pieces of paper. And there we sit. And in the front of the room is um, there's the FDA. There's there's a lot of important people. And they're going to listen. And for two days, there'd be a, there's two microphones in the center of the room. And people came up to the microphone and they voiced their opinion. And the entire rhetoric was exactly the same. On um, the OEM side, whether you believe it or not, and this is what's important, it's not relevant, whether I believe it, it's whether you believe it, they literally, there were four pictures that they flashed up on a thing. The one that comes to my mind the mostly was an anesthesia device. And the bellows assembly had come apart. And somebody took a wood screw and screwed it back in to make sure that the assembly would stay together. They took a picture of that and without coming out and so much saying it, they alluded to the fact that people died from situations like this. <coughs> the question, the concern that I had was, first of all, we don't even know for sure that it was an OEM rep or a non-OEM rep that did that. It could have been an OEM rep for all I know, number one. Number two, likely somebody didn't die. And number three, likely somebody could have been saved because of that screw, because it could have been in the middle of a case. Doctor could have been performing a pretty critical service. The screw allowed to continue the service to go on and get the, get the case done. And we don't know at the end of it that somebody didn't go back and fix it and fix it right. I don't know any other circumstances other than I see a picture taken out of context that I can't 
grab anything from. So that's what this two days was like. We're getting up there going, and, and we're, we didn't have any pictures, but I, I can only speak from a personal experience. I've been doing this for 35 years. I have had, I have followed in organizations where they have had manufacturing contracts for 20 plus years, opened up an x-ray room and literally seen dust kitties that, you know, like this. So my, my whole purpose from my perspective, and I say this all the time, where your paycheck comes from has absolutely no bearing on the abilities that you present to be a good technician. It's all about you as an individual. The OEM may have an opportunity to provide a little more resources, but you as an individual, if you don't choose to take advantage of those, but the guy that gets up in the morning has a fight with his wife or gets in a car accident way to work, his ability to stay focused and do his job is what's going to be impacted by what's happening to them in the morning, as opposed to, you know, the fact that he works for GE, so that makes him good. I mean, that's ridiculous, but... This is the claim that they were making, and we were making a claim that said, no, we don't dis we disagree with that. But in candor, <laughs> um, they had pictures, even though they were bullshit, excuse my friends, even though they weren't good. Um, they had pictures, we didn't. And um, so it got kind of funky. But a couple of things happened. One of the things in particular, Liberty Hooks were first to all the time, and I keep forgetting about it, is it was actually a hospital. So <clears throat> one of the claims the OEMs made were, Hospitals aren't reporting enough through the Safe Medical Devices Act. Everybody knows what that is. Please tell me you know what the Safe Medical Devices Act is. Okay. So the OEMs are claiming that we're saying that there's already a regulation in place, that if something goes wrong with a piece of medical equipment, we're obligated to report it. And they're saying, well, we think there's hospitals that are underreported. Well, in fact, the hospital from Boston stood up in the middle of this room and said, well, that's probably true, because if we have a piece of equipment that fails due to our negligence. I'm probably not going to report it because I don't want anybody to know that. Well, that didn't go over so big. But at the end of the day, what ends up happening is there's a lot of bantering back and forth. Our side is more emotional. Their side is more perceivably facts-based. And it creates a little bit more of a conundrum, but it doesn't get anywhere any further in terms of trying to come up with a solution. What happens next? So... The cool thing of it is, after some more conversations and some more other stuff, you guys probably know about this, but the um, the FDA did come back with what I believe, and I continuously say this, a significant olive branch for us, unless you're an OEM in this room, us. Um, here's what they did. Everybody's, remember when I told you about the seven words that they were asking for, two words in particular that were most important, service and remanufacturing. So the OEM or uh, the FDAs came back and they said, we distinctly are able to define the difference between servicer and remanufacturer. And what we believe is that as a servicer, the currently available objective evidence is not sufficient to include whether or not there is a widespread public health concern related to service, including by third party service of medical device that would justify imposing additional including by third-party servicers of medical devices that would justify imposing additional different but burdensome regulations requiring this time. I don't know what that means to you, but to me that was a huge win because I believe that everybody in this room, I'm making some assumptions, so if I'm wrong, let me know. Most of you guys are fixing equipment. You're doing your PMs, you're servicing medical equipment and breaks, and the FDA, whether you realize it or not, if you look at this, says, we don't think there's an issue. Now, ECRI, if you're not familiar with who they are, you might want to know who they are because they bring a lot of value to us in terms of solid data and some other stuff. But ECRI was very instrumental in helping us do this. They demonstrated through millions of work orders that less than 0 0.0001, which essentially there were five work orders and over something like 10 years worth of history that everyone's ever reported on that actually even implicated that a medical device was involved in the loss of a life. And of those five, there was only one one work order that actually couldn't prove it, but might have actually been contributory to a disease, loss of a life. In 10 plus years of all those work orders, one instance. That in itself would not justify anything, because if you look at anything else in this life, such as lawnmower, kill more people than that. So, personally, I saw this as a huge, huge win, which meant that most of every single person that's at this conference and most of everybody in this industry 
just got somewhat of an olive branch that says, we don't think there's a problem here. However, and I don't know if anybody in this room, but does anybody actually do remanufacturing? Here's a question I have for you. Define remanufacturing. Because this is a huge problem right now. So I want to read these words because they're pretty critical. Majority of comments, complaints, and adverse events reports allegedly that the inadequate servicing caused or contributed to clinical adverse events and deaths actually pertain to remanufacturing and not servicing. The problem that we're running into and that they're still fighting, now this was in 2016, we're now in 2021, so that's five years. To this day, they just recently came out with an official definition of remanufacturing, but it's still pretty nebulous. So the, one of the biggest terms says, if you've done anything significant to change the device, then you're a remanufacturer. Somebody define for me significant. What's significant mean to you? Change the design of it. What's significant mean to you? Kind of the same thing. It, it, it somehow changed its form or changed it from its original form or function. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd interpret it like uh, an anesthesia machine. The Fabius has that big bellows there, changing it from the piston driven to a gas driven. That would be a significant change. Yeah, that'd be a good example if you ask me. I, here's my deal, I, I, and I think you guys are alluding to it. And as you, from my perspective, significant difference would mean that you're altering the device from doing what it was originally intended and designed to do, as far as I'm concerned. But here's what the OEMs are trying to do, because they're, they don't see this as a win, but they saw it as, holy crap, at least it's something. But what they're trying to do, and be very clear about this, they're trying to say everything that we do every day in terms of just regular servicing, in their mind is considered significant. Because if you go and you buy something other than a non-OEM part, they're defining that as a significant change. Which again, I don't think it'll happen, but if they would ever win that case, we're right back where we started. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, like even the remanufacturing, if you want to call them that, you know, these folks that buy your imaging equipment and take it back to their shop, paint the covers, maybe they find a defective system circuit card is that they take one out of another system, put it in, test it. That's the manufacturing. They, they want to define that as the, the OEMs want to define that as the manufacturer. So yeah. it, it, it's a significant impact to our industry. So I'm curious where the why the OEMs are doing this because they kick themselves in the rear all the time. Like Philips came out with that software update that made us use Philips batteries. But then they couldn't even sell us batteries for the VS4s that were out there. Like I think so, OEMs don't realize that they're creating a problem that they can't solve. So that's a great point. And, and I'm going to do my best to try to answer it. And I, I would ask anybody else to participate here from your perspective. Here's how I think what's going on. You take GE and Phillips in particular, take Siemens. These guys are multi-billion dollar organizations, worldwide billion dollar organizations, the United States being one of their largest entities. What ends up happening is, and if you've ever worked with GE in any significant manner, literally the guy that's running the new sales and the new socket sales doesn't even know who this guy is over here running the IT at the, the ISO side. They don't even know each other. They work for the same company. I mean, I literally was in a meeting two weeks ago with the guy that runs the, the ISO division that couldn't even tell me half of what I knew about his company. Another conversation. Um, but what's happening here is, and correct me if I'm wrong, how many people here have all the capital money that they need to go buy everything that their hospital wants? Oh, gee, nobody's raising their hand. Surprise. And in fact, it's getting less than it's ever been. So where GE, and, I'm, and I'm, I don't mean to pick on these guys, but it's just easy because everybody has the imagery that they can pick up on, say, GE, Phillips, or Siemens, right? I mean, but it could be any manufacturer. It could be anybody else. But the fact of the matter is, is that what, so when I started, when I started in this industry back in the early 80s, you know, I mean, hospitals, I need a new CT, I need a new MRI, I need a new catheter. They just, just wrote it, wrote the check. Today they can. And so what's happening is these guys that were making all this money from selling all this capital equipment, that's come to a screeching halt for lots of reasons. First of all, it was a pandemic, and then there's got stuff where hospitals don't have capital like they used to. And oh, by the way, cybersecurity and the IT infrastructure eating up 80% of whatever capital dollars they have. I mean, it's just, it's a perfect storm. Well, these guys, you know, shareholders, Fortune 500 companies, Phillips, GE, 
they got to figure out a way to get that revenue back. Well, the first place that they went to is if you, does anybody know a, a, a basic idea how much money is being spent on an annual basis for servicing of medical equipment and healthcare? $11 billion. So if they can go get 25% of that, they can make up for the loss of the sales on the heart, on the plug sockets. That's, this is nothing more than a land grab and a money deal. But two things. FDA, and this is one of the things I'm proud of them for, when we started on this road, FDA came around and said, look, money cannot be discussed. You cannot bring money into this. Only thing that matters is safety. So even if it costs us twice as much, FDA has got to stand there and go, we're doing this because we're trying to bring safety to patients. Money cannot be part of the conversation. So that worked in our advantage. But yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if that answers your question, but I'm telling you, that's what's driving this thing all the way through. Anybody care to either and one of the things that I've noticed lately is it, because it used to be primarily imaging guys, right? They were so protective of that. But I've seen it now with with some of the non-imaging stuff. So say Striper and their camera equipment. Complete, you can't do anything with it. You can't get parts, you can't do anything. I had a, um, a company, Integra, that makes a little headlight of all things. I, I just need the, I need the part, right? The little fan on the back. Oh, we can't sell you that. What do you mean you can't sell me that? Well, the FDA says you can't repair that. And I said, bullshit. This is total bullshit. You're telling me an absolute lie. So I can't speak to you specifically what you're saying, but based on what you just said, yeah. my interpretation could be that that device is considered a either a disposable or a one-time use, which means that if you service it, then you're basically doing remanufacturing. Well, but, I can't speak to that, but I think that but they'll through. service it. You can send it back. Oh, well. and they'll put the parts on and send it back to you um, at about half the cost to buy it originally. Look, so, this and I, I didn't realize crazy. how fast this is going. I, I got have to go. So all I'm telling you is. I don't know if you've heard about it, but this is going on with cars. This is going on with tractors and farms. I mean, the farmers are getting put out of business right now because the, the tractor that used to cost like nothing so they could do their work now costs them more than their houses and they're run by computers and they're not allowed to fix them anymore and they can't afford to even get them fixed so they can continue to do. This is really becoming a problem. Airlines, a whole bit, everything is, and people are trying to figure out how they can keep their money, right? And so this is what's going on. Uh, let me, um, so again, we, this is this was their definition of um, you know what's servicing, what's remanufacturing, and again, significantly changes the finished device. So and and, and again, it, it, I always look at this as this is one of my favorite pictures. If you look at a graph, depending on which side of the end of that graph you're looking at, you can make your case. So as a non-OEM, I'm telling you significantly, I don't have to worry about that. As an OEM, they're sitting there going, oh hell yeah, everything you do is significant. And, and who can define it? They're, we're right in there. So Dave, uh, just to reiterate, talking about the, the root cause of this, even though it might've been over a decade or two after the DRA or whatever pandemic, is that uh, they were looking to recover a lack of capital sales with service revenue. And yeah. it, it really boils down to that, that simple. It, it is absolutely that, 100%, 100%. Um, so, yeah, I talked about where we're at. So here's the next phase. So again, the FDA is like, I don't know what we're going to do from here, but we have defined servicing and remanufacturing, but we still got to figure out a way. You know, we were charged by the Congress to go figure out what we're going to do here. And so they still didn't know and they still had all kinds of, you know, Midas still, by the way, Midas spends about a half a million dollars a quarter on going to Congress to fight this. On our side, how many of you guys put up some money to buy the, to help fight this recently? Or not? Okay, so really, we're up against a big, this is big horse. Anyways, they decided to hold a two-day meeting. It's great. Anybody participate? Um, two-day meeting in Washington, D.C. Had 100 people there. They tried to get equal representation from the OEMs, from the, from the um, ISOs, HDOs, a whole bit. There literally were 10 tables, 10 seats to a table. We spent half the first day walking through scenarios around, if this device broke, how would you handle it? And they asked everybody at the table to participate. Well, let me tell you something. That was a really cool experience. Because when you sat there and you listened to what the OEM, the OEM had to say, or as a patient had to say, or you're like, I really hadn't thought about it from that perspective. So the second half of the first day, we got and we actually talked about, you know, we presented our cases, we presented how we came to resolution and how we had to work through with each other to talk about it. Pretty eye opening, to be honest with you. Second day, we did a little more of that, a little more roundtable discussion. But then what we did was we actually sat in a horseshoe. There were 25 of us of the hundred that they asked us to sit up at the front of the room. 
and they asked us to represent the, the entity for which we were there, right? So I represented ISOs, OEMs were there, and they all had attorneys, by the way. Um, Amy was there, uh, FDA was there. There was all these like, you know, one of those big entities being supported. And the 75 people in the room were allowed to ask us any question they want, and then we were supposed to respond as us, as who we were, as who we were representing. Got to be pretty cool. Got to be hairy on a few occasions. It was nationally televised, by the way. It was really kind of a funky deal. At the end of the day, what ended up happening was the FDA said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to ask you guys to go solve this yourselves. We're going to create medical device servicing collaborative community. Now, the FDA over the last couple of years has been diligently trying to build these collaborative communities. There's 12 of them that they have in place today. And what they do is they're asking to make sure that there's equal representation from everybody that could be impacted on this. They're asking the groups to come to the table, sit down and try to come up with a solution. Long story short, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's happened. The 25 of us that were at the front of the table were asked to be part of the initial steering committee and then go get what through, through several meetings, through several opportunities. We were holding meetings once a month. We have been holding meetings once a month for the past five years. Um, and we have we are working towards trying to create a full medical device community collaborative has been taken off the table in the last five years the fda has said you can't be a collaborative community recognized as a true collaborative community unless you apply and that you're accepted as that and so we're in the process of trying to get there but it's going to come with some some commitment and time and yada yada and part of our problem right now from a collaborative perspective was uh, about two years ago or so, the manufacturer's representatives decided, you know what, we're not participating in this. Yeah. yeah, well, that's, I was just going to go. Thank you, Chris. That's where I was going to go. So, anyway. yeah, so the, the next thing was so, as you can see, I put the collaborative C in red because this is we started out as a collaborative community. We got together and a group, we, we met at the Amy office in Washington and we came up with the five categories and we wanted five representatives voting members, representatives to be part of the steering committee. So as you can see, it was the OEMs, there was the HDOs, the ISOs, um, pa patient advocates, and then there's the, the and, uh, agencies such as FDA, AMI, ECRI. That, yeah, yeah, so that, you know, that there, there are groups that represent us, but don't necessarily do the servicing or whatever cases. So we, we've, we essentially have 25 people that represent the industry, that we're getting together on a once a month basis. Um, and then in addition to that, we have another group, which is a steering committee, plus anybody else that wants to participate that we hold a monthly conference call for people to get involved and engaged that we're trying to get through this. The initiative, by the way, which, which is initially decided by the FDA was, look, don't ask us to solve this problem because if we do, somebody's gonna be upset because we don't know enough about it and we're gonna make a decision that's probably not gonna be in the best interest of anybody. So they said, we're gonna give you an opportunity. We want you guys representing these to go away and come back to us a solution. And for the most part, most of us said, you know what, that sounds great. And it's, it, nobody, I, I, as much as I've been doing this for as long as I have, why would I not want to try to improve quality and safety of patient care? I mean, I want to, I'm not saying I don't, but I don't want to do it at the cost of putting myself out of a job or giving a hospital the opportunity to have an alternative solution. That's most important to me. Anyways, so we go down the road, and today, these are the representatives. You can see OEM, ISO, HDO, organizations, and users, and a couple of non-voting members. This is the steering committee today. These are the actual people. If you know anybody up there, like Mr. Chris, reach out to them if you want to get involved and know what's going on. But that's the actual today. Um, so uh, we, we start going on. So as Chris said, here's where we go. So we get into the meet now. We've been doing this for about 18 months. This is at the time, about 18 months. and. Um, Abby May, Maida, and Phillips, they were all representing the OEMs at the time. We're into this thing for a year and a half. Abby May, in particular, and Maida, who have stalemated every single topic that we've tried to talk about. Every time we start going down the road to have a conversation, they'd go, I object. I object. This is getting into antitrust laws. This is getting into areas that you know we shouldn't be talking about. And they would just slow the process up. Just slow it up. So finally, after a year and a half, they go, we don't want to participate anymore. And they write an article and say the reason they're not participating is because we're not making any, we're not making any headway. We're not getting anywhere. 
So when I was interviewed, I said, the reason we didn't get anywhere is because you guys wouldn't let us. So now that you're gone, we'll actually get something done in the last 18 months. We've been doing some great stuff. And I'm going to tell you about it in a few minutes. Matter of fact, here they are. So we put together a document, which we can share with you, is training in terms of what is the biomed world all about? What do each of those things represent? HDO, ISO, OEMs. What do they mean? What do they do? We put a document out so you can find that out. And the training, well, that's actually what this one is. The training one, we actually put together a white paper, which, by the way, I'm going to share with you guys in a minute because I'd love your guys' input to it, is we put together what we think is best practice white paper in terms of how you all should consider training your people to make sure that they're right and that they have the support that they need to provide service where they need to put it. Key performance indicators, that's one that I'm working on, I'm chairing. Um, Chris and I and others are actually, we've got six healthcare organizations, we don't need to know their names. We'll pull all of our data together for one year and we're actually looking to create KPIs and benchmarks to see if we can't create industry standards so you all would have something as a reference. If we came back and said, hypothetically, you know, um, I don't know, what response time should be, boom, and we say this could be it, you guys could say, well, let's see how I correlate to that. And by the way, here's the definition of how we got there. So you can say, oh, that's cool. I, I, I'm better than that. Or I guess I got some areas to work on. Let's see, we'll see what I can do to change. So we're trying to create that, which we think would be valuable. And by the way, the impetus behind this is if we can do this and people have this in place, which is for all intents and purposes is a microcosm of what a quality management system looks like, um, it would give people an opportunity to uh, to be able to defend and prove that they're doing quality, safe, effective service. Quality management system, that's actually, uh, that's a group that's gotten together and they've taken 1345, they've taken EQ56, hopefully you guys know what those are, and they're putting them together a, a, a white paper in terms of if you follow the tenets of these components of those two, you're going to have a QMS system that you can be proud of that can demonstrate that you're doing safe, quality, safe servicing medical equipment without making it a mandate. And the last one that we most recently put in is we've got an active group getting together trying to find more bodies to fit those 25 slots, and in particular the OEMs, and we've done pretty well. We recently brought in ECRI and AORM, which are two big ones to become part of this group. Uh, so some of the stuff that we got going on, um, we had to ratify the charter, which we've done, which can, again, 18 months and the OEMs just kept saying no, no, no. They walk out the door the very next month, ratified, very minimal changes. Um, uh, sure, at the end of your representation, as I told you, we just added the ACRI and uh, AON. Continue with the four subgroups we've added to, which is around communication, which uh, Chris is chairing, and the membership. So, some good stuff there. Uh, so, the right to repair, this kind of got, and this kind of got really uh, exposed and, and enlightened. Um, by these two congressmen in particular, um, Senator out of Oregon and another one out of New York, and they were like, hey, wait, we got to do something, and so that really got things fired up. So um, just out of curiosity, I mean, I know I've been battling for a while, but I, I mean, have you guys seen anything? Has this impacted you at all? Is right to repair? Have, have you been in, like, you know, you try to get service and they tell you that you can't and you know i mean i gotta believe in some right way or form everybody here has been impacted at some level against all of us so this is what we're trying to solve for so, so i think david to that point if you would let me just talk a little bit i think the pandemic really was an eye opening for people like us in the in-house because there were some oems that said hey we're not coming in and even though we're, we're regulatory mandated right we have cms Joint Commission or PNB, uh, you know, there are regulatory bodies that we have to comply with. And, uh, you know, by having an in house or an ISO that's doing the service, we were there day in and day out doing the service. Um, so that really put a light on the OEMs and their reluctance to really be a part of it. Yeah, it's COVID. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, and everybody knows the, the, to your guess and to your point was the ventilators, right? I mean, that was a big thing. Hospitals didn't have enough. OEMs couldn't produce them, and even if they could, they wouldn't support them. They wouldn't come in and do it, and they wouldn't give us the parts that we needed, and they would refuse to do service. That's where those two Democrats, by the way, those two those two congressmen, that's where that was their their mantra to go up the hill and say, "Hey, we got to do something about this." And then it's just been snowballing and inertia from there. So um, I don't know if you guys are aware of this mod reports. So there's been an initiative by the FDA that mandates that if you have a safe medical devices occurrence and you're filling it out. 
you now have, and, and, and we can we can be here all day having this conversation, but you now have when you're filling out this report, was this device serviced by a third party servicer? I want somebody in this room to tell me what that means. Yes, sir. Third parties mean that they're the OEM. How about if you're working house? See, that's, I agree with you, but there's others that won't understand that and won't agree with that. Oh, yeah, the OEM is a subcontractor. Yeah, so there you go. So, what if it's the OEM that's doing ISO work? ISO work. So the big, the, the biggest thing, and we've given, we've given the FDA feedback through our steering committee, saying, listen, we appreciate what you're trying to do, and we're in agreement with it, but that's a lousy question because yeah. <laughs> it doesn't tell you anything. As a matter of fact, it, it, to me. If they start collecting this data and they make any decisions on this data, it's really going to be a problem. I disagree. I actually think uh, that might benefit us. How is that? Because they check no to that. It's a service by a third party. They do a service by the OEM. You have the OEM has got a bunch of check marks against them because, in my opinion, the OEM does worse than we do. When I call a GE tech support and they send me a field service engineer and I'm showing him how to operate the equipment, yeah. I, on the surface, I agree 100% with you, but as I said, what if somebody doesn't understand that question and they, they give the wrong answer? See what I'm saying? I mean, that's my point. Yeah, because the users are still Right. I mean, that's, that's my Yeah, see, that, I agree with you 100%. If we knew for sure that people filled this out identically every time, then I would agree 100%. This would, then I, said, I agree with the concept. I think the question is lousy. The question should be stated differently so it's more clear, so we know exactly what the information is. So we can go with it. I think it should be worded as was this device serviced by OEM or others? Yeah, I don't even say it. Was it, was it serviced by the manufacturer? Yeah. Period. Is, Nurse Nancy's assigned to do this. Nurse Nancy does it. But she's also the same one who says my my um, fusion pump is possessed. Yeah. <laughs> so my bogey's broken and there's a single bogey in the whole system? Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, you guys should be aware about this. Um, still, even if it's OEM. That one's hard because a lot of OEMs have like GE, they're third party right. doing it. Right. Right. But right. that's why I think it'll fit this because if we pay GE to do the work and GE hires Bob Services to come do it, it fails. But we pay GE. Yeah. GE yeah. did that. Yeah. Your point is there's devices that are manufactured by a company, but they have no service organization. So right. That's, yeah. that's right. We aren't, we're completely aligned. It would be yeah. phenomenal. If the data is collected and it's accurate, we understood it, then I think it's beyond belief. But the way it sits right now, we wouldn't be able to get to that. And that's going to be the problem. Just so you guys are aware of it. So, again, this all ties into, even though what I've been talking about is really around the Safe Medical Devices Act, which is initiated by the FDA, which now they've denied that they initiated. And they've asked us to just pick it up and keep moving. Um, there's still this right to repair thing that's going on. And so, just so you know, 27 states right now have lawsuits going on within the states to determine whether or not they're going to allow mandated right to repair. Could be the states that you're in right now, I don't know which every one of them, but there's actually 27. Start with Massachusetts, which by the way, we won that one. But that was for automobiles only. They excluded medical equipment. Um, some stuff, just real quick, you know, one of the things that, that I, let's keep political views aside. One of the good things that Mr. Biden has done is he actually signed an initiative to say that the Federal Trade Commission must look into this to see if we can, you know, see if we can't see what's going on and make sure that there's not monopolization going on and that, you know, that we have the right to be able to maintain our own equipment. So it, it's a positive thing. By the way, in next week, the week after, I'll be in Washington. We're meeting with the FDA, we're meeting with the FTC, and we're meeting with several different Congress people to have this conversation. We've done this over a dozen times over the last three or four years. We're making really good headway, but again, we're not spending a half a billion dollars a quarter to try to win this battle. Yep, thanks. All right, real quick, we're going to cruise. Oh, by the way, I don't know if you guys, I know you guys all know about what's the cervical robot. Sure, yeah. yeah, they're being sued because they're not allowing people to do their service anymore. So that, if that works, that would be great for all of us. It's just another one where we're taking them down a little bit. Uh, so biggest thing about all this is, what I'm trying to tell you is, there's a whole lot of stuff going on. There's some perfect storms going on. We got the pandemic going on. We got the OEMs who are trying to prevent us from doing work. And then we got, so those are just real quick numbers. How many people are in this industry? OEMs, ISOs, HDOs, anybody got a guess? 
45 to 50,000. Anybody want to guess how many will be out of this out of this field within the next two years, three years? 20 to 25%. So we're going to be down 10 to 12,000 of 50,000 people. And right now with 24 schools that have closed in the past couple of years, on average 300 are coming in a year. We're going to be upside down really quick. We're already there. If you guys don't see how many job openings there are, it's insane. And the thing that I'll just tell you, the, I'm sorry? It's pre COVID, we were starting to go that way. Yeah. Oh, there's no COVID, nothing to do with it. Yeah. But that's not helping because I can just tell you, even myself, I'm kind of tired. I'm just tired. I mean, it's just too much work and there ain't enough people. It's it's going to get it's gonna get worse, a whole lot worse. Dave, how can we help you with this stuff? Well, glad you asked. Real quickly, let me just, I just want to tell you one couple of things. So, this is my view of the world. I love this slide. It's just me. You can tell me I'm crazy. So, what do we got to do? This is around safety and quality. I would love to improve safety and quality for patient care. I'm not telling you I wouldn't. I will do whatever it takes. That's what I've spent 35 years trying to do. I think it relates to our training and skills. OEMs need to give us that. I think it the resources. We need the bodies to get it done. It's around parts. OEMs have to give us the parts. It's around tools. They need to give us the tools. That includes software, whatever it takes so we can do it. And lastly, it's around G average. We got to make sure that we have the resources to do what we got to do. Here's what I think. Love this piece. So we want it so that we can do it all and tell the, the OEMs to go pound sand. Never going to happen. Never going to get 100%. They want it. So we go away. Never going to happen. Tell them to go pound sand. Somewhere in the middle. That's what's going to end up happening. But if we don't all work together, it's not going to work. Here's what I believe. If this, I can guarantee you this, I would put everything on it. If every single healthcare facility in this world was to go back to the OEM tomorrow and say, I'm going to buy a PM only contract, and you have to do it in a time frame that I need it done, according to your manual, we would cripple them in three months and they would beg us to come back and be partners. If I could make that happen, if I had one wish in my life, that would be my dream because I guarantee at that point they'd come back and sit at the table and we could get to a meeting because without us, they're dead. They're dead without us. The most, the, the best, um, the best OEMs are, as an example, stairs. They see that by partnering with us, training us, giving us the parts, that the, when the vent, when the client wants to replace their sterilization equipment, they go, well, we want to get stairs because it's always up and running. We got all kinds of support. My in guys, in house guys can support it. And and why do we want to buy? Because it's good stuff. The ones where you're fighting all the time and they're always this constant battle, but you need to use us. And, oh, yeah, clinicians are going, why do I want to buy that crap? All right, real quick, these are the things you can do. You ask the question, this is it. There's two things that are going on. Anybody that wants can go to LinkedIn, go to the medical device servicing community, ask to be a member. I'll click in in five seconds. You'll at least get updates as to what we're doing, how we're doing it. I'd recommend that I ask you to participate. I ask you to get involved. Whatever that looks like for you, do it. You know? Your state. Yep. Get involved in your state level. It doesn't even have to be a federal thing. Yep. Get involved locally. Yep. So, I hope I didn't bore you. I hope I taught you a little something. And I would ask that, um, like I said, I mean, I, I feel a little good. I feel better than 50% that things are going our way, but it can easily slip back. And, um, you know, I, you know. I see a lot of push towards the, the quality systems get, and getting those those standards developed. Do you think that's something, I, mean, I see it a lot with the ISOs particularly. You think is it in house that we should be leading that direction to start those kind of processes? So let me tell you, this is this is a true case. You can do what you want with it. Initially, the FDA came out and said we are going to go to 1345, and anybody else that does that, that we exonerated from the situation. Very quickly, they realized, whoa, whoa, we shouldn't have said that. That was a stupid thing to say. But what they are, what what I will tell you is something's going to happen. Couldn't even begin to tell you what or what it's going to look like. But I can sit here today and tell you, if you were to become 1345, you will be a long ways down the road to whatever's going to come. Fair? Do you agree? Yeah. Yeah. Especially Mark back here. Yeah. Yeah. And the problem is the cost, right? Yeah. So, uh, so to your point, and I don't mean to interrupt you, but real, so one of the things that we're trying to do through Scott Torino and that thing that I told you about was we're trying to give you tenants of things that you could do 
that aren't necessarily a certification or a registration, but that you could be putting in place that demonstrate you're working towards it. Yeah. And, and if you go back, uh, I want to say maybe it's two years, uh, at an MBXO, I want to say it was in Dallas, I did a presentation and following me was uh, Blake Collins yeah. and, and, and that group also right, did right. a presentation. Right. Essentially what we did was crosswalk what we do today from a regulatory perspective for CMS, and, and the state regulators, we crosswalked all of that activity to what 1485 uh, okay. talked about. If you look, I'm sure it's on the I saw uh, part of the that. publishing. Yeah, I did. Just go to that and if you start to put policies in place associated with that. Yeah, I, I, right to Chris's way. point, especially at in house, it, it may be get cost prohibitive, but you can go look at 1345 or go to EQ56 or you know, this new thing that we're about to create, and you can see that. Well, I would need to do this, I would need to do this. You can do those things and then never actually have to pay somebody to come in and validate it. Right. And that's going to, regardless of what's going to happen, which it will be something, it'll get you really far down the road to being and the successful. And EQ56. Yeah. Stand, read that. Well. Yeah. Yeah. And that's being changed as we as we speak yeah, right. to enhance it even more. Any questions, thoughts? I, I appreciate your time. I hope you got something out of it. Please join the LinkedIn because like right now, that's one thing I'm going to tell you. So we're, we just came out with this uh, training document. And uh, if you're on the LinkedIn, we're actually going to put it out there and we're asking for people, for feedback. we're getting out there with a white paper, we're asking for people for feedback. So get on it and give us feedback. Appreciate your time. Thank you, David. Thank you.